Let's round of applause for your first speaker of the day, Oliver Her. How to launch your project without getting hacked. Very important, guys. Give a huge round of applause for Oliver. We're not going to talk about the shadowy super coders, Anon hackers so much. We, we try to take the, the other perspective today, like how can you navigate Web3 security because I think it's like super hard, especially for new projects entering the space. And the, the first problem is the auditor market, and I, I, I hope the next slide will resonate with some people. So if you're a new project coming into the space, you're doing smart contracts, you kind of know like, okay, I need to get audits, right? But then you have this big challenge like, okay, which auditor do I choose? Um, and most of the time people know like this tier one auditors like Trail of Bits, Open Zeppelin, Dep.org, and you write them an email and they come back like, yeah, you can come back in six months and it will cost you like $200,000. And uh, then many projects are like, oh, okay, I, ca I cannot pay $200,000 three times a year as a bootstrap project. It's, it's impossible. And, and then you dive, dive into like, okay, what other auditors are in the market? But it's nearly impossible to, to like check the track record of an auditor and to um, see if the auditor is good or not. You basically would need to re-audit your own code and then compare it to what the auditor did. And that's not feasible either. So you have basically two options. One is like you invest a lot of time into research and then you in the end gamble on, on any auditor that you find and hope that he's good and that you get like good value for your money. Or you're somehow lucky and you know someone who's like really familiar with security, is following all the hacks, is following all the auditors and can recommend you a, a good choice. And we believe that this is actually an incentive problem that uh, can be solved, and I want to present two solutions um, how, how we could solve this issue. So first, why is it so hard to select an auditor? Like, what are the incentive problems? One is there's no risk sharing. So if an auditor is like reviewing all your code and you're getting hacked the next day, the, the auditor will say like, oh, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, sorry that happened to you, but by the way, my payment is due anyways. Uh, so it's, you know, like you, you have all the risk, all the damages, and the order has literally none. And what we have well have seen is that there's little to no reputational damage. Like there's like one big auditor, people still coming up to me and, and tell me like proudly that they will get an audit from them. Their name is uh, Certic. I, I'm now in the camp of shaming people, sorry. Um, and, you know, like, like so many times you like see on my feed popped up, like this project is getting hacked. Who got it audited from? Certic. And so I don't know why, but there's like no reputational damages for like really bad auditors. Um, so that f doesn't work either. And um, yeah, as I said, it's uh, nearly impossible to verify the track record. Well, you can look at the list of projects that have been hacked and you can look who are the auditors that had audited them. But just because an auditor is not on this list doesn't mean it's a good auditor. So, yeah, it's a really hard problem. Um, so what we want to do is we want to change um, these, uh, um, these um, incentive problems. And the first solution we see is um, we call it skin in the game auditor. So the auditor offers their clients, hey, I take part of my payment and put it into a bug bounty. So a bug bounty, for those who don't know, um, is after you launch, if a hacker finds a way to steal your money, hack your code, whatever, he can tell you and you give him a reward for that. So basically you give the hacker a way out uh, and monetize his know-how without harming your project and your community. And so if the, um, if the auditor offers to put part of his payment into your bug bounty, that means he's A, very confident in him, his code, uh, in his review, and B, if something goes wrong and someone uh, finds an issue he missed, he will lose part of his payment. So suddenly he shares the risk with you. And this allows um, projects to select as well tier two and tier three auditors, which have like good price value, because if someone offers this to them, it will give them trust, like, okay, this guy is actually gonna review my code, otherwise he's gonna lose his, his payment. And um, additionally, depending on how long the auditor will share the risk with you, he as well has an incentive to stay engaged. So um, if you agree on a period of six months, he will have a in financial incentive to keep reviewing your code and make sure that if something externally changes, he will let you know about it. And we think that this aligning of incentives is really beautiful. And the second solution that we propose is um, audit challenges or audit competitions, uh, especially what we call the, the cutthroat model. Um, so the best practice that we recommend is first, 
you, you do an audit with a legacy firm, so you have a trusted design partner, you do multiple iterations, they, they tell you like, okay, I would do the architecture in a different way. And after you have completed this process, you run one of those, the audit competitions. It's an open an invitation to anyone come and audit, and we do that on-chain, so it can even be anons, and we have like a huge community in South America, in India, um, the guys that don't want to go through KYC in the US, um, they can come and they get purely uh, rewarded based on results. So anyone can submit vulnerabilities and only the um, valid ones will get paid, which is as well amazing for projects because we tell them like, okay, you did three audits, do this audit competition now, either your code is safe, it's for free, you don't pay a cent, no fees, no, nothing to security researchers, or we find more vulnerabilities and afterwards you're really, really happy that those vulnerabilities still have been found before you launch. And uh, recently we had like two projects got audited by like, best auditors in the space, and we found three critical issues and two critical issues, respectively. So um, I, I think this is definitely going to be um, the new standard. And the security researcher community as well loves it. They love this gamified aspect of like, you have 14 days to hunt bugs, and they like talk to each other in Discord, and like, um, how can you crack the code? And um, it, so it's actually a win-win for the project and, and for the security researcher. And um, the, the sole fact that you have instead, in a legacy audit, you usually have like three to five people looking at your code, depending on which auditor you go to. In this competition model, we have seen 300 to 1,000 people looking at your code. So um, in, in auditing, it's more quality over quantity, but still, if you have 1,000 people looking at your code, the chances that everything is getting found is, is getting way higher. And uh, what I think personally is really cool um, is that um, depending on how you structure the model, the good auditors, they earn a lot of money, and the bad auditors that are good at making fancy PDFs but miss every vulnerability in your code, they walk away empty-handed. And uh, actually, down here, you can see what uh, Midjourney's interpretation of this was. Like, up here are the, the auditors earning a lot, and down there are the poor auditors that have to walk uh, home uh, without any payment. So, but there's another um, very big problem in security. And um, that is, it's uh, super hard to be ethical as a hacker. And I think this is a pretty fitting topic for uh, the Luna stage. Um, because um, I don't know if you have uh, heard about it, but in Europe, it's uh, very um, dangerous to be an ethical hacker. In Italy, recently, three students, they found um, a vulnerability in an app. They reported it to um, the, the developer of this app. And their response was that they get arrested. Sorry for the old number. We had uh, $3.4 billion hacked and stolen, and only $10 million in bug bounties paid out. So there's like a really big discrepancy between the numbers. And one reason of that is how the process works. So the Web2 disclosure process is like this. I'm a white hat hacker, and I found a vulnerability. So I have the information on it, and I request a bug bounty from the builder. Um, but for the builder to evaluate if this vulnerability is real or not, you have to show him what you found, right? Otherwise, how would he know that it's real? So you show your information, and suddenly the builder realizes, wait a minute, I still have all my money, and I have all the information I need. So what happens often? Ciao. The go he goes to the hacker, because the hacker has no tools to enforce getting paid. Uh, he, he has no like, proof or evidence or something like that he can bring to a court. So um, this is actually a situation that um, gets reported to us on a, like, a weekly basis from like, many security researchers. And uh, now we are on Web3, and this sounds like a super solvable solution, like, uh, a problem, right? So all you have to do is you have to put the bug bounty into a vault, and only then this, the white hat hacker shows the information to, to the builder. So the money is already in the vault, and now the builder realizes, OK, um, this is the information on, on the vulnerability. I try to ghost you now, but what happens is we give the white attacker a new tool to his hand, which is a decentral court. So we are building something ourselves there, but we as well work with uh, Kleros, so there will be like an expert committee um, which try to make fair decisions. So it's always important to balance the interest between the projects and the hacker. There's like no solution where you just say the hacker is right every time. Like this is not, I think, a de desired state either. But um, so he can request a ruling. The court will look at all of the evidence that's presented. So in our case, that's what was the definition of the bound bounty and what is the cryptographic proof of the vulnerability with the timestamp and everything. And they will make their ruling. And if the court then decides, okay, the hacker actually did 
like just save like this ecosystem, save the users money and so on, the white attacker will get paid. So the question now is like, why, why is this even uh, important? Um, when I'm a project, why would I give up control over my bug bounty? Like many, like if you talk to the big projects, they get like really antsy about it because they don't want to pay if they don't completely agree. But actually, you, you want to increase the efficiency of your bug bounty. So you want to have more people looking through your code and disclosing, and as well, make the option to disclose way more attractive than stealing the money. So, I mean, a stolen dollar is not really worth one dollar because you have to wash it. So, um, and depending on how big the size is, like if you steal 100 million dollars, it's rather hard to get that onto your bank account because any like, agency in the world will be on your tracks, um, all the exchanges will monitor all your wallets and so on. Um, but still, we need to make it a um, way easier choice to go down the ethical route. And what is maybe surprising to many, but these um, really, really good hackers, they are actually from top universities in the world. Uh, so you have maybe some guy from MIT who is like this super computer nerd who just found a vulnerability. This guy, he actually wants an ethical career. Yeah? He doesn't want to live in the shadows and do criminal stuff. So I, I think the meme about these like 14-year-olds living in the basement of their mom and hacking all the, the projects, there are some people like that, but like the majority is actually like people that went through university and like want to do like a good ethical career. Yeah, so that's my talk. Uh, we still have eight minutes for questions, so I love to have a discussion or like hear your like experiences with like working security, launching a project. And uh, yeah, if you want to um, check out uh, how we solve these issues, you you can uh, scan a QR code or w visit our website. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions or ideas? You can tell me as well if my talk sucked, uh, so just tell me in my face, no problem. Okay. Seems like we have no questions. No. Hi. Uh, what is the amount of bounties you have? Because, I mean, there's platforms like Code Arena and Sherlock, DeFi, which also have these kind of competitions. So, are you competitive in terms of the bounty you can get out of it? Mm -hmm. So, um, depends on the project. So, we have bounties that are um, like $500,000 big. We have as well bounties that are like $20,000. It, it depends as well like how much attack surface you have. If you close sourced and don't have smart contracts, then the bounty is smaller. And we have seen that uh, as of now, the on-chain bounty is usually um, smaller than the, the bounties that are just hosted on websites. Um, but the question um, I have, and we had some, um, some instances where white attackers, they claim bounties on like Immunify or like one of these like um, centralized bug bounty platforms. And the project told them like, listen, we don't have the money anymore, uh, especially now in the bear market. So the bounties are smaller, but I, what I would question is like how big are the bounties really on those websites? Do they really can pay this two million that they claim they will pay you or, or not? Um, so, yeah. Does this answer the question? Okay. Oh, and for the audit competitions, we have like a price pool of around about 100K most of the time. And this 100K is getting paid out on average to 80% in these audit competitions in like 10 to 14 days. So. Um, Actually, quite interesting. We have like a few guys that come over and over, and they're getting like paid for single submissions nineteen thousand dollars for like if you find these critical vulnerabilities in the audit competitions. And in our model, you don't need to share your money with latecomers. So in in Code for Arena, you have like everyone who finds the same issue is sharing the reward. Uh, for us, it's only the first one, and then it gets flagged in GitHub. So all the other um, security researchers they don't need to waste time finding the same issue over and over which is as well super annoying for the project because they get like 50 reports for the same vulnerability. And uh, this made it very attractive for experts to come because they know if they come in and find this critical issue first, they, they can get like 15K, 18K for like this, this issue alone. And we have a few guys that are coming over and over again and finding these big issues that the auditors have missed, which is like blew our mind, yeah? So um, Reft Finance has been audited by Trail of Bits, probably the best auditor in the space. 
and uh, the last project we as well was um, audited by Y Academy as well, amazing auditor, and we as well found two critical issues, so that, that has been really good for us. Cool. Hi. Hello. So um, you were suggesting before one of the of the ways of attracting more auditors and making the space more uh, yeah like uh, equal or fair um, is to only pay it for valid findings. Yeah. But then it raises the concern for me about yeah if I see a project and I don't yeah I feel it's quite good I may not even go and look at it because mm. you know I, I'm not gonna get paid. So have you thought about that? Uh, we thought about it, uh, but uh, the situation never really came. So we have projects that have been going through three audits and we still had like uh, paid out 30k out of 100k of price pool. Um, so um, I think auditors are just humans and we need to accept that and even the best auditors will miss something. And, um, but, and we believe, like the, the competition model works really well if there's only a few vulnerabilities left because if you have like a price pool of $100,000 and there is 60 uh, uh, findings that 60 people sh uh, share this $100,000. If there's three findings, then it's re getting really, really attractive. So what we actually um, proposing or what we recommend to project is first doing an audit with the firm to have this like trusted design partner and only then run the competition model. And then depending on how we structure the rules of this model, it's still attractive even if the code is more mature. So as of now, um, actually we believe the competition model is better for more mature code than for like really shitty code. Um, I have a question related to your model since um, you are paying out uh, just for the uh, first auditor that finds given vulnerability. That means you need to like confirm this vulnerability very quickly uh, so you, you know that it's a valid one. And another thing related to that is that does that have like bad impact on the quality of rep reports because if I find something interesting I want to you know submit it as soon as possible instead of like spending time on writing proof of concept and like making sure that qualities uh, of, of report and you know the, the content is very very well written and so on because there might be someone else working on the same stuff that might just you know submit it quicker with the lower quality so where, where you put that uh, you know uh, yeah. barrier um, so for the first question um, well the issue is public after the, it's submitted right so it doesn't matter if it's valid or not uh, I mean people would then not report a invalid submission again either, which is, I think, positive for the project. So uh, I think this doesn't really matter. For the second one, it's a really interesting question. And we are like, like tuning the model there as well. Uh, actually, we are, like, have a very active community because um, we are not building something like a central company. Like we are just building this protocol where projects self-host their bug bounties or audit competition. And so we have the opportunity because the ownership of this protocol will go to the, the projects, to the auditors, uh, to the ones that uh, are in the community either way, so they know they can shape the rules together with us. And one thing we are exploring right now is that for finding a vulnerability, you get 0 0.6 points. For the POC, you get uh, 0 0.2 points, and for the test as well, 0 0.2 points. That means if you find something, and write a shitty POC, someone can bring a better POC and can like, steal your 0 0.2 points. So there's like a, a, a second market for like writing good POCs and writing tests, which as well for us um, is a good way to get like new talent in that may be not so professional yet than these audit firms. Um, but this is an experiment we want to run, so I cannot tell you yet if this will solve all the problems. But um, I think being able to like uh, shape these rules is like so interesting. Like we have so many discussions as well, like should it be time-based? Like one auditor come in and said like, okay, if a uh, vulnerability is found very early in the competition, maybe it's just a super random standard one everyone can find. It should get less money than something really late. And then we had this discussion, okay, doesn't this uh, create a new incentive to gamble on like, should I report something or should I wait until I report it? So there's like all of these dis different parameters we can tweak and we're like trying and discussing and innovating on this as constantly. I think the, the competition model is still something that where we can do a lot of cool stuff and it's not completely explored yet. Thank you. Okay, I think my time is up. <laughs> Thank you.